entering now are the candidates from the Pratt School of Engineering.
Next, please welcome the candidates from the Sanford School of Public Policy. Now, the candidates from the Nicholas School of the Environment. Entering the stadium are the candidates from the Fuqua School of Business.
Entering now are the candidates from the School of Nursing. Welcome the candidates from the Divinity School. Currently entering are the candidates from the School of Law.
Please welcome the candidates from the School of Medicine. Now entering are the candidates from the graduate school.
Please rise and remain standing as we recognize the faculties of Duke University, the Duke University administration, the members of the Board of Trustees, followed by the members of the Platform Party.
Please remain standing for the presentation of our colors by members of Duke University's Air Force ROTC program and the singing of our national anthem.
Let us pray. God of all God joy, of all joy and, gladness, and gladness, we delight in the goodness and glory of this day. As our faces beam with smiles that contain the sun and rays of glory, we marvel at the wonders of your all-inclusive love. With the song of the cicadas buzzing through the trees and the tune of birds whistling in the wind, all creation joins this celebration today. We are hope-infused as we peer into the futures that await. We rejoice in the hard-earned wisdom you've taught through classes past and the ones dropped just before the drop-ahead deadline. Even as we remember when we were just two days into college and three lectures behind, we thank you for the surprises along the way. Like that so few food points stretched so far and the grant funds came in time for rent. We praise you today for the 99 prior graduating classes and for all who've gone before us paving the way for our successes. We are especially grateful for those who've broken barriers to make Duke an ever more inclusive place those who we recognize as a first to do it, and those whose names we'll never know, for each who've traveled the rocky road to make ours at least somewhat smoother, we give you thanks. We delight in the ones who've made us laugh, and we treasure all who've held us when all we could say was, serenity now. We're in awe of the communities we've been part of here and our brushes with greatness. Though we've taken L's like a no longer perfect GPA and a missed internship and failed friendships, we celebrate today because there have been W's in classes and labs, on courts and in fields, and most importantly, with people who've made sure we were not alone. Thanksgiving fills our hearts and minds as we remember all who've made the blessing and joy of today possible. We treasure and give thanks for the countless multitude of family and friends, of professors and mentors, of administrators and housekeepers, of trustees and groundskeepers, of donors and dishwashers and Durham community members, of those who have given us second chances at redemption and fought for second chances for others, and of all who will never get the credit they deserve for how they've helped us make it to this day. Show us how to embody beyond Duke the lessons learned on this campus from sustainable practices that benefit the planet to the communal care that benefits our souls. As we leave this place, make us more and more people who value and embody respect, trust, inclusion, discovery, and excellence. Give us grace to be humble, strength to be honest, courage to be hopeful, and ever more mindful of the humanity that makes each person worthy of honor. We offer these prayers to you with gratitude for the gift of today and for the class of 2024. Amen. Good morning, class of 2024. I am absolutely delighted to join your faculty, your families and friends, and congratulations to you for reaching this significant milestone, your commencement. Today is, fittingly, Mother's Day. When we come together in gratitude for the love and the support that sustains us and in that spirit, let's begin by showing our appreciation for the mothers, family members, friends who are with us here today and who have supported us and guided our extraordinary graduates on their journey. Let's also recognize the exceptional Duke Wynn Symphony, our student ensemble, and all of the students, the volunteers, staff, and faculty who have made today's celebration possible. We will now hear greetings from our student representatives, Zara Hassan and Kayla Thompson, as well as from Academic Council Chair Trina Jones, who will share greetings on behalf of our faculty. Good morning, Devils. 
On behalf of my undergraduate peers, I'm proud to welcome everyone to Duke's 2024 commencement. For many of us, this is our first ever graduation ceremony. More importantly, our moms are salivating to make up for lost Proud Mom Facebook posts. So happy Mother's Day. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. The bee, of course, flies anyway, because bees don't care what humans think is impossible. The Bee Movie which features Speaker Seinfeld's starring role as fellow graduate Barry B. Benson, <laughs> reflects our journey to this stadium. When we arrived at Duke in fall 2020, simply attending class felt impossible. Since then, we've overcome challenging classes, internships, and long lines to get yet another free tote bag. And this March, we, alongside Duke Band and Cheer, watch both John Shire and Carol Lawson bust Obama's brackets through unthinkable upsets. My friends are afraid that it's impossible for life after graduation to match the joy of college. But I think there's a lot to look forward to. Firstly, though we'll truly miss Duke basketball, we'll also no longer take elbows in the face in the Cameron Crazy student section. And after today, we can get paid to solve problems rather than pay Duke to assign us more problems. <laughs> Finally, we can design our own syllabus without pesky T-Rex. At Duke, I learned both how to interpret complex data and how to swim. Now, we can decide what we learn, from how to cook outside of a dorm to how to solve climate change or global conflicts, because if bees can do the impossible, we can too. Thank you and have an incredible day today. Good morning, fellow classmates, faculty, family, and friends, and welcome to commencement. I am deeply humbled and honored to be standing before you today. As graduate and professional students, Duke means different things to each of us. Many were asked to set aside their alma maters and make room in their hearts to cheer on a new basketball team. Others, like myself, traded in the comfort of our West Campus dorms for a chance to discover what it truly means to be a Duramite. Others still said goodbye to their home countries and traveled to the U.S. for the first time to come to Duke for graduate school. But no matter the paths we took to get here, Duke became a special place for all of us. And today, I can't help but feel immense gratitude gratitude for the supportive faculty members who guided us in our research, for the alumni who took us under their wings at internships across the country, for the picnics in the gardens on beautiful spring afternoons, and for the friendships that will sustain us for a lifetime. But most of all, I am grateful for this place that has propelled each of us one step closer to achieving our dreams. For me, that's having my parents in the stands today, watching as I, a first-generation college student, now hold not only a bachelor's degree, but also two graduate degrees from this esteemed university. So as we continue on to the next chapter of our lives, let us be grateful for the time we shared at Duke whether it was just a year or, in my case, nearly a decade. And let that gratitude carry us forward in the work we will do, 
the change we will affect, and the communities we will better. Thank you, Duke, for what you mean to me and to each of us here today. Good morning. On behalf of my faculty colleagues, I am delighted to offer congratulations to the Duke University Class of 2024. As chair of the Academic Council, which is Duke's version of a faculty senate, I have the honor of carrying the university mace during formal academic processions, such as the one that preceded this ceremony. Though the mace weighs only eight pounds, I find its heft and distinctive artistry to be fitting symbols of the responsibilities and privileges that come with membership in our academic community. Each semester, my faculty colleagues and I delight in encountering students like you, who are eager to learn, to explore, to test the boundaries of knowledge, and to expand the boundaries of what you believe you can achieve. As much as we enjoy guiding your learning and growth, we delight even more in the many ways your perspectives and curiosity challenge us to consider familiar subject matter anew. As the famous poet has noted, the teacher is always learning. Sometimes your questions and ideas help us to answer persistent queries, solve long-standing mysteries, or lead us to discover new approaches to a thorny problem. For all of that, we, the faculty, thank you. Class of 2024, as we celebrate your graduation from this university, we also celebrate the many forms your learning has taken during your time at Duke. For many of you, that learning included periods of remote study. Since then, whether in the classroom or the lab, during late nights in the library, or through service to your community, you have demonstrated a remarkable commitment to learning and a passion for using your knowledge to benefit the world. Class of 2024, we are very proud of all that you have achieved at Duke and we look forward to everything that you will accomplish in the future. On behalf of the faculty, congratulations. Thank you, Professor Jones, Zara, and Kayla for those thoughtful words of welcome. A commencement marks an important moment in time. Today we mark the end of your studies at Duke and the beginning of your lives as Duke alumni. Today's commencement ceremony also marks another significant point of inflection. This year, as we celebrate our university's centennial, we're also celebrating the 100th class to graduate from Duke. Perhaps you've noticed that many of our graduates are wearing blue robes today as a special symbol of this milestone. This wonderful alignment of two profound turning points, our centennial and your graduation today, is a moment both of inflection and a moment for reflection. It's an opportunity to reflect on all that we together have learned and achieved since Trinity College was transformed into our Duke University. 
And it's an opportunity to look ahead to the great promise, your great promise, as a generation called to lead in an uncertain world. Looking forward and looking back, I feel a sense of profound confidence that you are up to the challenge. Indeed, you've already seen and persevered through some unanticipated twists and turns in the road. Many of you saw your senior years of high school disrupted by the pandemic and missed out on your graduation then. And all of you have had to navigate several years of significant academic and social disruption. The undergraduate class of 24 arrived at Duke before COVID vaccines were available. At a time when masking and social distancing were our best tools for protecting each other, even though they were antithetical to community building and the typical college experience. So remarkably, this is the first time you've all been together in person for a traditional, formal, academic exercise. As you may recall, in August of 2020, our new student convocation took place virtually. So you watched on YouTube, at least I hope you did, as we welcomed all of you to our academic community. Now, despite these challenges, you have thrived. In the classroom and beyond, you've taken advantage of everything that Duke has to offer and what it means to be an educated and engaged citizen of the world. During your time at Duke, you've built new connections and you've developed new traditions. And you absolutely have played more spike ball than any class before or since. Looking forward, we have no idea what the world will bring. As the politically turbulent and violent events of this year have illustrated, we live in unpredictable times. But on this point, our centennial may be instructive and I think encouraging. A hundred years ago, the graduating class of 1924 similarly had no idea what lay before them. They didn't know that just six months later, James B. Duke would sign his indenture of trust that turned their alma mater, Trinity College, into our university. And that stroke of Mr. Duke's pen not only transformed our institution, it also secured for the class of 1924 a legacy as the last students to graduate from Trinity. And in a fascinating turn of history, the class of 24 also gave us our alma mater, dear old Duke. But they had no idea of that at the time. Indulge me in a minute with the story. Trinity in 1924 celebrated the completion of studies with a traditional lowering of the class flag. You see, LDOC has come a long way from flag lowering to sway lee wheel on the quad, right? Well, during their flag lowering ceremony, the Trinity class of 1924 sang a student composed hymn to Trinity that had been catching on around campus at the time. And it began, Trinity, thy name we sing. To thee our voices raise, they raise. To thee our anthems ring in everlasting praise. As an aside, the May 14, 1924 issue of the Trinity Chronicle that published for the first time this hymn also reported an interesting vignette of campus life at the time. Quote, one student bet another that he couldn't put a billiard ball in his mouth. Result, it had to be punched out with a cue stick. Like I said, Duke students, you've come a long way in 100 years. Following the unforeseen creation of Duke University, an adaptation of that hymn to Trinity was officially adopted in 1925 as our alma mater. But of course, the word Trinity had to be replaced. And as Duke is just one symbol, uh, syllable, and Duke University is six, they went with, that's right, dear old Duke. 
at a time, let's remember, when dear old Duke was not even one year old. Although our traditions have evolved with time and we no longer raise and lower flags at the beginning or the end of the academic year, we do sing Dear Old Duke together at formal events and gatherings. And we'll sing it together again today at the end of this ceremony. And whether performed by a pep band, a choir, or as it rings from the carillon every Friday evening, our alma mater symbolizes the enduring connections to Duke that unite us as a community, whether we're here together or apart. And I hope it will always remind you, now that you know its origin story, that while we cannot foresee the future, while we have no idea of what our next day or year or decade or century will bring, like Trinity College, we can look forward to grander times ahead. I hope that throughout your lives, however far your fates may bear you, you will forever feel at home at this place. And whatever the future brings, and I hope not swallowing a billiard ball on a bet, perhaps when you hear that familiar melody of Dear Old Duke, you'll pause to reflect on what this university, what its people have meant in your life. Congratulations to the great class of 2024. I am now delighted to welcome the chair of the Duke University Board of Trustees, Lorraine Sperling, to formally open this commencement for the awarding of honorary degrees. And before we begin, though, I would like to take this opportunity to publicly recognize Lorraine for her outstanding service as chair of our board these past three years. Though we, she will. <laughs> though she will uh, conclude her term as chair this summer, she will remain at, in her service as a trustee. And we are so deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, I am now pleased to declare this commencement open. <laughs> Duke, Duke, Duke University awards honorary degrees to recognize extraordinary achievement and service to the world. The candidates for honorary degrees have been enthusiastically approved by the faculty of the university and by the board of trustees. Each will be accompanied by a faculty sponsor. I am. I am now pleased to confer, by the power vested in me, honorary degrees upon four exceptional candidates. Though our fifth honorary degree candidate, Rose Marcario, was unfortunately unable to join us here today, we hope to award her degree at a future commencement. To today's recipients, we know that your example will inspire our graduates to pursue careers of equal purpose, and principle. And we are proud to welcome you to our university community. I invite Mark Anthony Neal, the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of African and African American Studies, to accompany to the podium C.B. Claiborne, candidate for the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Claudius C.B. Claiborne, a 
arrived at Duke on a presidential scholarship in the fall of 1965 and soon made history. He wore the Duke jersey for the freshman basketball team and in the process became Duke's first black student athlete. Although his talents attracted an offer to join the Harlem Globetrotters after he earned a mechanical engineering degree in 1969, CB instead pursued a career as an engineer, product developer, and professor. Along the way, he helped create the adjustable steering wheel for the Ford Motor Company. CB earned master's degrees from both Dartmouth College and Washington University in St. Louis and a PhD from Virginia Tech. CB is currently a professor of business and marketing in the Jesse H. Jones School of Business at Texas Southern University. He is widely regarded for his teaching and his scholarship and has been recognized as an Apple Distinguished Educator, Fulbright Scholar, Sasakawa Fellow, and Coors Eminent Scholar. CB, for your many contributions to business, leadership, and education, I am delighted to confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Thank you. I now invite Sofia Enriquez, the Andrew W. Mellon Assistant Professor of Music and Latinx Studies, to accompany to the podium Rhiannon Giddens, candidate for the honorary degree of Doctor of Arts. Rhiannon Giddens is a North Carolina native and award-winning singer, songwriter, and instrumentalist. Throughout her career, she has worked to advance a more accurate understanding of the origins of American music and to bring recognition to people whose roles in our musical history have been overlooked or erased. A graduate of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, she was an original member of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, a string band formed here in Durham that was awarded a Grammy for Best Traditional Folk Album. As a, as a solo artist, Rhiannon was awarded the 2022 Grammy for Best Folk Album. And in 2017, she was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship Grant. Rhiannon co-wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning opera Omar based on the true story of a 19th century West African Muslim scholar, Omar Ibn Said, who was enslaved and brought to North Carolina. Most recently, Rhiannon can be heard playing the banjo and viola on Beyonce's hit song, Texas Hold'em. <laughs> Rhiannon, for your innovative and distinctive artistry, I am delighted to confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Arts. I now invite James Coleman the John S. Bradway Distinguished Professor of the Practice of Law, to accompany to the podium Desmond Mead, candidate for the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. Thanks to the work 
of Desmond Mead and his team at the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Millions of Floridians, including Desmond himself, have become eligible to vote. Desmond overcame adversity, including homelessness and imprisonment, on his way to graduating summa cum laude from Miami-Dade Community College and earning a law degree from Florida International University. During his studies, Desmond began working with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, also known as the FRRC, and in 2009 became the organization's executive director. Under his leadership, the FRRC successfully campaigned for the passage of a state constitutional amendment in 2018, restoring voting rights to returning citizens with felony convictions. About 1.4 million Floridians became eligible to vote, the largest expansion of voting rights in our country in 50 years. The following year, Time Magazine recognized Desmond as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. In 2021, he received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. And just last year, the FRRC was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Desmond, for your pursuit of justice and voting rights, I am delighted to confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. I now invite Neil Bell, the Mary DBT and James Siemens Professor of the Practice of Theater Studies, to accompany to the podium Jerry Seinfeld, candidate for the honorary degree of Doctor of Arts. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to receiving an honorary degree, Jerry is also serving as our commencement speaker today. So what's the big deal about our commencement speaker? So, thank you, thank you. So, what's the big deal about our commencement speaker? Aside from the fact that we're perhaps all wondering whether he's wearing a puffy shirt under this gown. Uh, let me explain. Jerry is a comedian, actor, writer, producer, director, yada, yada, yada. In short, he is a true cultural icon. He's best known for co-creating and starring in the long-running, culturally acclaimed sitcom Seinfeld. From 1989, to 1998, before the days of streaming services and DVRs, tens of millions of Americans made weekly appointments to tune into Seinfeld. More than 25 years since the series finale, Seinfeld remains popular in syndication. The show asked provocative questions like, what's the deal with lampshades? Or, if there's a brunch, how come there's no lupper or liner? <laughs> Seinfeld made us think 
about the proper etiquette for dipping chips at a public gathering, and also introduced us to the airing of grievances known as Festivus. Variety magazine ranked Seinfeld as the eighth greatest show of all time, observing that, quote, few shows are as adept at speaking confidentially, confidently rather, a language entirely of their creator's own design and trusting that audiences would stay on the ride. As Zahra alluded, as Zahra alluded, some of our students may know Jerry best as the voice of the animated character Barry B. Benson, the lovable bee who pursued justice in a bee movie. Jerry also launched an award-winning popular web series called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, and he has authored multiple books, recently made his directorial film debut, and continues to delight stand-up com comedy audiences with belly aching laughs. As Jerry once told a 60 Minutes interviewer, the sound of laughter is to him, quote, a moment of pure flight. In addition to his creative work, Jerry and his wife Jessica are also proud Duke parents and the founders of the Good Plus Foundation. <laughs> and as founders of the Good Plus Foundation, they support addressing family poverty through this charitable organization. Jerry, for your extraordinary contributions to the arts and to society, I am pleased to confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Arts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh my God, what a beautiful day, what a beautiful class. We love you guys. I am here today at the gracious invitation of President Price and the Duke Board of Trustees because after spending four years at what is considered one of the finest institutions of higher education in the world, they apparently feel that perhaps some light entertainment will get you all to the final realization, you know, I think I've really had enough of this place. <laughs> Let's bring in a comedian. Let's bring the sophistication and erudition of the Duke experience down a couple notches. <laughs> and I thought maybe that does make sense. Maybe the thinking was what we really want is to just get these kids the hell out of here. <laughs> what would give them that last final push? Because what you might not be fully aware of is that the entire time you have been at this wonderful university, we have been meeting and talking to other kids that we would like to replace you with. <clears throat> not because we weren't happy with you, not at all. You have been great. It's just, you know, we wanted to see what's out there. I don't want to say exactly how many kids we talked to. It's roughly this many. And we met a lot of wonderful kids, a lot. Was there a time when we were thrilled to have you come here to learn, grow, and flourish? Of course there was. That time has passed. <laughs> we do offer graduate programs in a number of different disciplines if you and your parents want to stall your ultimate uselessness for a few more years. <laughs> I can't imagine how sick you are of hearing about following your passion. I say, the hell with passion. Find something you can do, that would be great. If you try something and it doesn't work, that's okay too. Most things do not work. Most things are not good. You know this already from your short lives. You leave the house, you come back. How was pie and hard? Eh. It was okay. That's why everyone tries so hard to get in here. Duke actually is really good. 
The school is the square handicap button that opens the broad head doors to your life. <laughs> Unless it's those heavy wooden doors at the West Union, those will kill you. <laughs> Let go of this idea that you have to find this one great thing that is my passion, my great passion, with your shirt torn open and your heaving pec muscles. It's embarrassing. Just be willing to do your work as hard as you can with the ability you have. We don't need the heavy breathing and the outstretched arm from your passion. It makes coworkers uncomfortable in the cubicle next to you. <laughs> Find fascination. Fascination is way better than passion. It's not so sweaty. I will give you my three real keys to life. No jokes in this part. Okay, they are, number one, bust your ass. Number two, pay attention. Number three, fall in love. Number one, you obviously already know whatever you're doing, I don't care if it's your job, your hobby, a relationship, getting a reservation at M Sushi, make an effort. Just pure, stupid, no real idea what I'm doing here, effort. Effort always yields a positive value, even if the outcome of the effort is absolute failure of the desired result. This is a rule of life. Just swing the bat and pray is not a bad approach to a lot of things. Number two, pay attention. If you're in a small submersible that looks like a giant kazoo and going to visit the Titanic, seven miles down at the bottom of the ocean, and the captain of the vessel is using a Game Boy controller, pay attention to that. What are you checking out down there? Oh, I see what happened. This ship sank. <laughs> now I understand why it never made it into port. If the fish where you are have eyes like Shelley Duval and a bendy straw with a work light hanging off their head, you do not belong there. <laughs> if the fish are going, I can't see a goddamn thing, you won't either. <laughs> Number three. Fall in love. It's easy to fall in love with people. I suggest falling in love with anything and everything, every chance you get. Fall in love with your coffee, your sneakers, your blue zone parking space. I've had a lot of fun in life falling in love with stupid, meaningless physical objects. The object I love the most is the clear barrel Bic pen, $1.29 for a box of 10. I can fall in love with a car turn signal switch that has a nice feel to it, a pizza crust that collapses with just the right amount of pressure. I have truly spent my life focusing on the smallest things imaginable, completely oblivious to all the big issues of living. Find something where you love the good parts and don't mind the bad parts too much. The torture you're comfortable with. This is the golden path to victory in life. Work, exercise, relationships, they all have a solid component of pure torture, and they are all 1,000% worth it. Privilege is a word that has taken quite a beating lately. Privilege today seems to be the worst thing you can have. I would like to take a moment to defend it. Again, a lot of you are thinking, I can't believe they invited this guy. Too late. I say, use your privilege. I grew up a Jewish boy from New York. That is a privilege if you want to be a comedian. Thanks. If I messed up a funny story around my relatives, they would go, that's not how you tell that joke. The prostitute has to be behind the drapes when the wife comes in. You went to Duke. That is an unbelievable privilege. I now have an honorary doctorate of Humane Letters degree from Duke University. And if I can figure out a way to use that, I will. <laughs> I haven't figured anything out yet. I think it's pretty much as useful in real life as this outfit I'm wearing. <laughs> but so what? I'll take it. My point is we're embarrassed about things we should be proud of and proud of things we should be embarrassed about. When I was writing my TV series, Thanks. What a crowd. 
So on my staff in the 90s, we had a lot of Harvard guys. They were fantastic, but I could never understand why these guys were so embarrassed about being from Harvard. They would never talk about it. They would never mention it. I'm not talking about Harvard now. I'm talking about the way it used to be. <laughs> You're never going to believe this. Harvard used to be a great place to go to school. <laughs> now it's Duke. You didn't fake your fabulous education. You earned it. Be proud of it. Don't just drop it on people right before you serve in pickleball. OK, Duke 24 coming at you. But if it comes up, if someone asks, don't say it looking down, stubbing your toe in the dirt. When someone asks, where'd you go to school? You say, I went to Duke. Watch them take that uncomfortable, hard swallow. AI, on the other hand, is the most embarrassing thing we've ever invented in mankind's time on Earth. Oh, so you can't do the work. Is that what you're telling me? You can't figure it out? This seems to be the justification of AI. I couldn't do it. This is something to be embarrassed about. The ad campaign for ChatGPT should be the opposite of Nike. You just can't do it. <laughs> Making fake brains is risky. Frankenstein proved that. He was so dumb, he thought a monster needed a sport jacket. It's not a wine tasting. We're terrorizing villagers. No one's going to tell you, I'm sorry, Mr. Stein, it's jackets only this evening. What I like is we're smart enough to invent AI, dumb enough to need it, and still so stupid we can't figure out if we did the right thing. Making work easier, this is the problem so obsessed with getting to the answer, completing the project, producing a result, which are all valid things, but not where the richness of the human experience lies. The only two things you ever need to pay attention to in life are work and love, things that are self-justified in the experience and who cares about the result. Stop rushing to what you perceive as some valuable end point. Learn to enjoy the expenditure of energy that may or may not be on the correct path. Now, if you have been at this amazing place for four years and still have no idea what you like, what you're interested in, or what you want to do in life, you are the luckiest ones here. Those of you that think you know what you want to do are very likely wrong and perhaps even overestimating your ability to do it. <laughs> you have convinced yourself that you know who you are and what's going on in the world. You don't know either. The less secure and confident you feel in the direction, the more surprises and excitement you will have in store. That's good. So the better the job you've done in finding a path for yourself, the more boring and predictable your life is going to be. If you're sitting here today completely confused, feeling lost, adrift, and totally abandoned, you might even be a G. I say, congratulations. You win the Duke commencement ceremonies of 2024. You are about to go on a hell of a ride. About work, you know how they always say, nobody ever looks back on their life and wishes they spent more time at the office? Well, why? Why don't they? Guess what? Depends on the job. If you took a stupid job that you find out you hate and you don't leave, that's your fault. Don't blame work. Work is wonderful. I definitely will not be looking back on my life wishing I work less. If that's not how you feel at work, quit. On your lunch break, disappear. Make people go, what happened to that guy? I don't know. He said he was getting something to eat. Never came back. The one thing I know about this gang here, you are all worker bees, and I mean that as the highest compliment. I love bees. <laughs> Beautiful, amazing, elegant society. I made a cartoon movie about bees you may have watched as a child. If any of you felt slightly uncomfortable about the sexual undertones in the relationship between Barry the bee and Vanessa, the florist who saves his life, I would like to apologize for that now. <laughs> I may not have calibrated that perfectly, but I would not change it. And this is probably the biggest point I would like to make to you here today regarding humor. 
I'm going to try and reach across a couple generations here to tell you the most important thing I am confident that I know about life. I'm 70. I'm done. You are just starting. I only want to help you. The slightly uncomfortable feeling of awkward humor is okay. It's not something you need to fix. I totally admire the ambitions of your generation to create a more just and inclusive society. I think it is also wonderful that you care so much about not hurting other people's feelings in the million and one ways we all do that every second of every day. It's lovely to want to fix those things, but, all caps, but, what I need to tell you as a comedian, do not lose your sense of humor. You can have no idea at this point in your life how much you are going to need it to get through. Not enough of life makes sense for you to be able to survive it without humor. And I know all of you here are going to use all of your brains and muscle and soul to improve the world, and I know you're going to do a bang-up job. And when you're done, as I am now, I bet the world, because of you, will be a much better place. But it will still not make a whole hell of a lot of sense. It'll be a better, different, but still pretty insane mess. And it is worth the sacrifice of an occasional discomfort to have some laughs. Don't lose that. Even if it's at the cost of occasional hard feelings, it's okay, you gotta laugh. That is the one thing at the end of your life you will not wish you did less of. Humor is the most powerful, most survival, essential quality you will ever have or need to navigate through the human experience. The other thing I see going on that throws a lot of people, thank you. I was hoping you'd like that part. The other thing I see going on that throws a lot of people off these days is thinking, I've got to make as much money as I can. I personally believe the real game is I want to have the coolest job. When I started out as a comedian, I did not think I was funny. I thought I'm a little funny. Maybe I wouldn't have to be that funny. I just have to be funny enough to feed one person. And I could do that with a loaf of Wonder Bread and a jar of peanut butter. A loaf of bread and some peanut butter. That was my actual plan. That's how you think when you do not have a Duke education. <laughs> I just wanted to have this super cool job. And cool is a word not easily defined. It's really just whatever you think is cool. So just go for what you think is the coolest. Money will be made eventually, somehow. Try not to think about it so much. I see this messing people up a lot. Put it to the side a little. Don't think about having, think about becoming. Having is fine, but focus on becoming. That is where it's at. And I know you're not really even listening to this speech, and that's okay. I wouldn't either. You're graduating, you're thinking about yourself or timing your mobile order from the Yala truck. That's all cool. But the one thing I really do care about communicating to you is don't lose your humor. Forget the rest, forget your education, your degree, your privilege. All of you here would do fantastically well without any of it. All of you here, without question, are the best of the best. Just don't lose your, hum your humor. It's not an accessory. It's your Stanley Cup water bottle on the brutal long hike of life. And humor is not just for the stress relief or even just the simple fun of laughing, but for the true perspective of the silliness of all humans and all existence. That's why you don't want to lose it. Try to enjoy some of the dumbness of it all. That's the best life advice I can give you. I wish you luck. I wish you love. Thanks for the phony degree and the ridiculous outfit. <laughs> Go get him, Duke class of 24. Throw the hat up. Let's get out of here. Congratulations. Thank you, Jerry, for those insightful 
remarks for reminding us of the importance of humor. Um, we're so proud to have you as a member of the Duke family, and we're proud that you're holding that phony degree. It's now my great pleasure to welcome our provost, Chief Academic Officer, and Alfred J. Hooks, Distinguished Professor Alec Gallimore. Thank you, Vince. This is a special day for the entire Duke community, and especially for our students who worked so hard to be here. Graduates, this is a significant moment, one that has required sacrifice, dedication, and trust in your ability to push yourself forward. You have left Duke a better place than how you found it through your openness to new ideas, experiences, and points of view, your contributions to our vibrant intellectual community, and your steadfast support for each other. You did it. And this is a moment to celebrate. But make no mistake, this is a moment in a life full of boundless, uncharted moments ahead of you. Take what you have learned and the skills you have developed. Extrapolate what you know now, and letting your curiosity guide you, apply it to all that is to come in your very bright future. Class of 2024, through all you have accomplished at Duke, you have made us so very proud, and we know you're just getting started. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. President, as the Chief Academic Officer of this great university, it is my pleasure to declare this convocation officially open for the awarding of earned degrees. As they are called, I invite the deans of the schools and the college to present the degrees the candidates have earned. I now call upon Susan Barbour, Dean of the Graduate School. Will the degree candidates of the Graduate School please rise? Mr. President, I am honored to present the talented candidates of the Graduate School who completed all the requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy, our highest academic honor, Masters of Arts, Master of Arts in Teaching, Master of Fine Arts, and Master of Science. By the authority vested in me, I am delighted to confer upon you these degrees in the Graduate School, and I welcome you to the company of those engaged in the continuing search for knowledge. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call on Mary Klotman, Dean of the School of Medicine. Will the degree candidates of the School of Medicine please rise? Mr. President, I have the honor to present the future leaders of quality health care for all. The ded dedicated candidates from the School of Medicine who have completed all requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Physical Therapy, Doctor of Occupational Therapy, Master of Biostatistics, Master of Health Sciences, Master of Health Sciences in Clinical Leadership, Master of Health Sciences in Clinical Research, Master of Management in Clinical Informatics, and Master of Science in Biomedical Sciences. By the authority vested in me, I hereby confer upon you these degrees in the School of Medicine and welcome you to the company of those dedicated to the care of human life and health. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call on Carrie Abrams, Dean of the School of Law. Will the degree candidates of the School of Law please rise?
Mr. President, I have the honor to present the exceptional candidates of the School of Law who seek to uphold the rule of law throughout the world while seeking justice for all. They have completed all requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Juridical Science, Juris Doctor, Master of Laws, Master of Laws in International and Comparative Law, and Master of Laws in Law and Entrepreneurship. By the authority vested in me, I am delighted to confer upon you these degrees in the School of Law, and I welcome you to the company of those committed to the pursuit of truth and justice. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call on Edgardo Colon Emmerich, Dean of the Divinity School. Will the degree candidates of the Divinity School please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the Christ called, Spirit sent, prophetic peacemaking candidates of the Divinity School, soñadores y soñadoras, who have completed all requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Ministry, Doctor of Theology, Master of Arts in Christian Practice, Master of Arts in Christian Studies, Master of Divinity, Master of Theological Studies, and Master of Theology. By the authority vested in me, I am pleased to confer upon you these degrees in the Divinity School and salute you as you embark on vocations in service to your high calling. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call on Michael Ralph, Interim Dean of the School of Nursing. Will the degree candidates of the School of Nursing please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor of presenting the exceptional candidates of the School of Nursing who will be tomorrow's leader in healthcare and to advance equity. These individuals have completed all the requirements of the Doctor of Nursing Practice, the Master of Science in Nursing, and the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. By the authority vested in me, I am delighted to confer upon you these degrees in the School of Nursing and welcome you to the company of those who apply their knowledge and compassion to provide skillful care. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call on Bill Boulding, Dean of the Fuqua School of Business. Will the degree candidates of the Fuqua School of Business please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the industrious candidates of the Fuqua School of Business who will lead with decency and have completed all requirements for the degrees of Master of Business Administration, Master of Management Studies, and Master of Science in Quantitative Management. Before I confer these degrees, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize Dean Bolding as he concludes his service as Dean of the Fuqua School of Business. That's it. Bill, as you step down this summer, I thank you for your outstanding leadership of the school over these past 13 years. Thank you so much. And now, by the authority vested in me, I hereby confer upon you these degrees in the Fuqua School of Business, and I welcome you to the work of building our economic future through thoughtful and responsible management. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. 
I now call on Lori Bonier, Interim Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment. Will the degree candidates of the Nicholas School of the Environment please rise? Woo, all right. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the tree-hugging, whale-loving, bee-protecting, climate-change-fighting candidates of the Nicholas School of the Environment who have completed all requirements for the degrees of Master of Environmental Management, Master of Forestry, and the International Master of Environmental Policy, the joint program between the Nicholas School and Sanford School of Public Policy. By the authority vested in me, I hereby confer upon you these degrees in the Nicholas School of the Environment and welcome you to the vital work of understanding and protecting our natural world. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call upon Judith Kelly, Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. In the name of Terry Sanford, former Duke University president, who told all Duke students to stand for something, even if it defeats them, will the candidates in the Sanford School of Public Policy please take a stand? You came, thank you. Mr. President, it is my honor to present to you the ass-busting, attention-paying, big and small things loving candidates who have been written approximately 3,492 memos have completed all the requirements for the degrees of Masters of Public Policy, Masters in International Development Policy, and the Masters in National Security Policy. Before granting these degrees, I would like to thank you, Dean Kelly, for your dedicated service to the Sanford School and your outstanding leadership over these past six years. Thank you so much. And now, by the authority vested in me, I hereby confer upon you these degrees in the Sanford School of Public Policy and welcome you to the company of those who seek to transform ideas into policies for our greater good. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. I now call upon Jerome Lynch, Dean of the Pratt School of Engineering. Will the degree candidates of the Pratt School of Engineering please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present the big-hearted, innovative, passionate, clever, entrepreneurial, tech-loving advancers of the social good, also known as the candidates of the Pratt School of Engineering, who have completed all requirements for the degrees of Master of Engineering, Master of Engineering Management, and Bachelor of Science in Engineering. By the authority vested in me, I hereby confer upon you these degrees in the Pratt School of Engineering and welcome you as you join those building the future and pioneering new paths for technology. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. Last but not least, I call on Gary Bennett, Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. Will the degree candidates for Trinity College of Arts and Sciences please rise if you can.
Mr. President, I am honored to present the nimble and knowledgeable, perceptive and precise, intuitive and insightful, clever and creative, sagacious and skillful, witty and wonderful, the devilishly dedicated candidates from Trinity College who completed all requirements necessary for the degrees of the Bachelor of Arts and the Bachelor of Sciences. And I am thrilled to confer upon you these degrees in Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. I wish you all the best as you begin your careers to pursue knowledge and to serve the world. Congratulations. Graduates, you may be seated. Congratulations again to all of our graduates. Throughout your time at Duke, you've already demonstrated that you're well prepared to lead lives of principled leadership. And in a society that's increasingly interconnected, you'll have greater opportunity than ever to make meaningful change in the world. But remember, you are not going it alone. We are all fortunate to be part of a community of exceptional people of accomplishment and purpose, connected by our shared values, a global Duke family numbering hundreds of thousands strong. And we rely upon each other for support, for intellectual challenge, and for fellowship in the encouragement to excel. Wherever life takes you from here, whether near to campus or a world away, Duke will always, always be your home. Congratulations to the great class of 2024. And now as we close the ceremony, please rise and join me and our student ensemble in singing of our alma mater, Dear Old Duke.
This concludes Duke University's 2024 commencement ceremony. For everyone's safety, we ask that you exit the stadium slowly and carefully.